Our next speaker is Paul Israel, who's the uh, director of the uh, Edison Papers Project, and he'll be speaking on the on the subject of from machine shops to industrial laboratories, New Jersey, and the reinvention of invention. Paul Israel, he's, he's the director and general editor of the Thomas A. Edison Papers here at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. And it's already produced uh, seven volumes of the published uh, papers, and there's an eighth volume that's currently in press. I'm delighted to say that Paul received his PhD from Rutgers uh, and has made the study of American invention and innovation his particular speciality. And he's written many books and articles on Edison and on, uh, on invention uh, in general, including uh, Edison, a Life of Invention, a prize-winning book. He won the prestigious Dexter Prize for that. Another title from Machine Shop to Industrial Laboratory, Telegraphy and the Changing Context of American Invention from 1830 to 1920. And then the definitive work on Edison's uh, Electric Light. Um, Edison's Electric Light, The Art of Invention, which was published or republished rather by Rutgers University Press as Edison's Electric Light Biography of an Invention. And it was co-authored uh, with Robert Friedel. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, uh, bring Paul Israel uh, to the stage and, uh, and, and hand the microphone right over to you. Thanks, thanks Corey. Let me uh, get my uh, PowerPoint set up here. There we are. Yep, all set. So, um, the, the topic of my talk, as you may have, have uh, guessed, uh, is related to the, the work that I've done on Edison and related um, histories of invention and innovation. And what I want to talk about is how we got from the kind of 19th century inventions around uh, machine shop culture to uh, sort of modern industrial um, laboratories and R&D. The machine shop was the center of inventive activity through most of the 19th century. Uh, general purpose machinery, lays, planers, drills, um, were used to make everything, right? And so um, both uh, individual inventions and also the machinery to manufacture them as well. And here in New Jersey, there were plenty of machine shops. Um, perhaps the most important was um, up near Morristown, Speedwell uh, Iron Works, uh, run by a fellow named Stephen Bale, who had an interest in a nail making factory that he transformed into a leading uh, uh, iron works that produced a number of innovations, uh, most notably um, and here you can see the, the kind of uh, interior of that, that works, as well as some of the machinery. Um, most notably, innovations in, in transportation. So the first transatlantic steamship, the engine was actually made at the iron works, as well as other elements of the ship. And uh, later on, with the introduction of uh, railway technology in the U.S., um, a lot of that work took place here in New Jersey, by the way, and uh, so a number of innovations around um, railway technology as well that were done at the ironworks. Most famously, it's known for an entirely separate invention. So at the works, uh, in this factory here that at one uh, point had been a, a cotton factory at Speedwell, um, the experiments were conducted by Samuel Morse and Bale's son, Alfred. Um, Morse himself was a portrait painter who um, in the 1830s was teaching at what was then called City College of New York. You know it today as New York University. Uh, one of the students attending that university was Alfred. And in his studio at the university, Morse was working on this idea he had first thought of during a, a transatlantic a trip between Britain and the U.S. where he'd talked to uh, someone familiar with, uh, with electricity and, and Morse had gotten to thinking about this uh, possibility of transmitting intelligence at a distance. On the left is a canvas stretcher and right under it is a, a port rule uh, from a printer's uh, shop. Um, Morse essentially took this kind of existing technology as his um, transmitter and receiver 
And it was Vail who converted that into the registers and keys that could be used in everyday operation on a telegraph system made out of metal, uh, something that could withstand constant usage. But the other key element of the telegraph was that it was also an electrical invention. And so for the first time, you also had to worry about the science behind the electricity itself, the knowledge that was being developed in universities. So at um, New York University, or the, what it was previously known as, uh, was Leonard Gale. He was a chemist. And a lot of chemists in that period were experimenting with these newfangled things called batteries, um, as well as more generally with electricity. And at Princeton University in New Jersey was a fellow named Joseph Henry, who next to Michael Faraday was probably the leading um, investigator in the world of the science of electricity. And both of them contributed to the development of the telegraph system that was created by uh, Morse and his associates. Uh, Henry's work on electromagnetism and on electromagnets uh, enabled Morse to figure out how to create a long distance circuit. And so this is, was really crucial to the work. So along comes a fellow named Thomas Edison, who was born in 1847 in Ohio, the same year the telegraph reached his hometown of Milan. And Edison himself started his career as a telegraph inventor. Uh, it looks like a school. It's actually a telegraph office in Cincinnati. But in many respects, this was the school for electricity for a lot of people in the middle and late uh, 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 the period right around the Civil War, I should say. Uh, which is when Edison was a uh, telegraph operator. So he took care of batteries, so he knew a little chemistry, and he had to understand the electricity involved in the telegraph system and adjusting wires and so on and so forth. Edison, like uh, many ambitious young telegraphers, also read works on electricity and related fields, uh, most notably Faraday's experimental researches. And this was, in fact, the leading research in this area in that period. Uh, if you want to know something about electricity, you turn to Faraday. And Edison frequently referred to Faraday uh, and his work throughout his career. But perhaps uh, from the standpoint of being an inventor, the most important uh, thing that happened to Edison was that he went from being in the Midwest, in towns like Cincinnati and Louisville, uh, to Boston. And Boston was important because this was the center of telegraph manufacturing. Um, it had become that center because of Harvard University, because of scientific instrument makers who were making electrical apparatus for the university who first got into manufacturing telegraph devices and then became places where a lot of telegraph technology could not only be built, but modified. And so when Edison first gets there, he actually writes an article for the paper, The Telegrapher, about all of the shops in Boston that were doing telegraph and electrical work and what kind of modifications were going on, including the work of the fellow on the lower left, Moses Farmer. I'm sure none of you have ever heard of him. He's the co-inventor of the fire alarm telegraph and a whole host of other uh, electrical inventions in this period, probably the leading electrical inventor of the period. The other fellow you've heard of, his name is Thomas Watson. And he was encountered by a guy named Alexander Graham Bell when he took his instruments in Charles Williams Jr. shop. And his idea is not just for acoustic telegraphy, to send multiple messages using different frequencies, but ultimately the telephone. And it's Watson that helped him to convert those ideas into physical instruments. And that's what Edison learned at, uh, in, through these shops. And Edison himself found space in Charles Williams Jr. shop, which is where uh, Watson and, and Farmer were both located, um, and was conducting his own experiments there. He worked on a number of things, an early uh, device for recording the vote of legislators, uh, printing telegraphs for uh, transmitting and recording uh, stock and gold and other commodity prices, and also an idea for sending more than one message simultaneously. And he, he found some backers for his experimental work. And he had that, the instruments made in William's shop. The double transmitter 
he took to New York to experiment with on a line between Rochester and New York and realized he needed to make some modifications. Unlike in Boston, where he had ready access to Charles Williams Jr.'s machinist to modify his instrument, as he told his backer, what delays me here is awaiting the alteration of my instruments on account of piling up of jobs, right? So he had to wait in line, uh, an important lesson that he soon uh, took care of as he became involved with the leading company involved in stock ticker uh, technology and, and market reporting technology using these printing telegraphs, the gold and stock telegraph company. And Edison soon signed an agreement with this company in 1870 for uh, continuing experiments that he was doing in printing telegraphs. And what did he get from the company exchange for this work? A skilled machinist, an experimental room for him to work in, and some instruments, right? These machine tools that could be used to make uh, modify to both make the instrument and make modifications in it, which is crucial to the inventive work that's going on. These are electromechanical devices. There's a stock ticker out in the display. You can see how mechanical uh, that device is. What's crucial is that Edison, realizing he needed an ongoing source of machine shop, uh, actually converted that into his first uh, commercial shop, the Newark Telegraph Works. And ultimately, Edison would have a very large shop in Newark near the Prudential Center. The arena uh, is where that shop was located and was manufacturing for Golden Stock the instruments that he was inventing as well. There's the universal stock ticker, the thing that's out uh, in the display area. Um, by 1870, Edison had this reputation, as the president of William, uh, William Morton of uh, Western Union put it, as probably the best electoral mechanician in the country, um, next to George Phelps, who was that company's uh, own inventor and working on printing telegraphs himself. Um, and Phelps was concerned that Edison was creating these improvements for golden stock uh, the concern was not that it was going to interfere with Western Union's intercity telegraph system, but rather that uh, another company could align itself with Golden Stock for the commercial uh, transmission of commercial news, which is one of the things that Western Union marketed. So they decided to take over West, uh, to, for Western Union to take over Golden Stock, and at the same time, Edison signed a contract with this new subsidiary of Western Union, Golden Stock, a five-year contract that paid him a yearly salary of $2,000 a year, which was very good money in those days, plus royalties um, and support for his inventive activities. Edison still didn't have a laboratory, so how did that come about? Well, Edison was not just working for Golden Stock and Western Union. He was also working for another company known as Automatic Telegraph, which was trying to compete with Western Union by having a high-speed system using perforated paper tape to transmit the message and at the other end, record it uh, electrochemically. So it was a little pen touching uh, chemically impregnated paper. Whenever the charge went through the pen, it discolored the paper, providing the dots and dashes in a recorded form. Edison took this system to Britain to try and interest the British Post Office Telegraph and the cable telegraph companies in it. Um, and he discovered, as he was demonstrating it, that there were some problems with that system, in part because in Britain there were underground lines and these undersea cables, which had all sorts of um, problems, presented all sorts of problems because of what were known as inductive effects that kind of slowed and disturbed the signal. And Edison had trouble overcoming these problems while he was in Britain. So he returns home having now encountered these problems and also having encountered a different telegraph community. Because, especially of the cable telegraphs uh, and the underground lines, British telegraphy had become what uh, William Preece, one of the chief uh, engineers of the uh, system, called uh, scientific, right? Uh, in the U.S., it was the absence of uh, submarine cables, underground wires, and more complicated apparatus like Edison's automatic. Um, that meant that telegraphers in the U.S. weren't really paying much attention to the, the kind of scientific understanding of these, of these issues. Whereas in Britain, they had had to do that, such that the telegraph engineer had become a kind of scientist, and the English uh, uh, 
because of this, um, the, the English telegraphy was really scientific telegraphy. And this is what Edison encounters. And so the first thing he does is he begins to order a bunch of equipment, including electrical measuring apparatus that had been designed by a fellow named uh, Sir William Thompson, also known as Lord Kelvin, who had developed this apparatus in combination with his improvements to the cable telegraph system. He's really the key figure in developing cable telegraph technology, one of the leading physicists of the day, right? And so Edison orders equipment. He begins to investigate more the chemistry of his recording system. And so he goes in the spring of 1873. By the beginning of December, he had a laboratory with what he described as every conceivable variety of electric apparatus and every, any quantity of chemicals for experimentation. Edison finally had a laboratory, but it was just in the corner of this machine shop, right? It was still the machine shop that was the key here. Not long after that, in the spring of 1875, Edison gave up his role as a manufacturer and went into inventing full time. He split the factory and building in half, taking half of it for his lab and the rest of it for uh, the factory. And he and his assistant, Charles Batchelor, wrote a long list of things they were going to improve, including the device there at the bottom known as the electric pen, little device with a motor. As you wrote, you created a stencil, and you squeegeed ink through it and, and got a copy. This was the forerunner of uh, A.B. Dick's mimeograph. And Dick later bought uh, patent rights to that and other uh, improvements that Edison made. But Newark was also known as the unhealthiest city in America at this time. And so Edison decided to get out of town and find something, someplace a little bit more pleasant. So in um, a bluff overlooking the railroad just outside of Metuchen, he found a place called Menlo Park that was a failed housing development and put up a laboratory. Two stories, uh, 25 by 100, filled with every kind of apparatus for scientific research. Um, his laboratory with machinery and apparatus have cost about $40,000, an enormous sum in that period. That tells you how successful Edison already was as an inventor, but also how imaginative he was about the future of invention, because he was really about to transform it. He wrote that letter to William Orton, the president of the company, in part because um, the machine shop um, uh, in the lab was costing about $100 a week to operate. And after spending all that money, Edison didn't have a lot of spare cash. Although he had a contract with Western Union for experimental work, he needed more direct support for the laboratory. And he actually signed a new contract, in part because he was working on uh, a new technology known as the telephone to improve it. And so uh, Western Union was actually providing about $100 a week for the maintenance of the shop at the laboratory for the experiments. Um, during this period, Edison improved the transmitter and sort of be, developed this sort of standard uh, carbon transmitter uh, that became part of the telephone system. And while working on the telephone, he came up with this idea for recording telephone messages and other sound that became the phonograph, the first device not just for, to record sound but to play it back, which gave Edison his reputation as the Wizard of, Men Wizard of Menlo Park. So by the um, spring of 1878, Edison was probably the most famous inventor in America. Uh, he was uh, somebody who had developed this new facility. He'd gotten direct support for it. Um, and now the stakes were going to be increased even higher with his plan to invent an electric light system. And the people connected with the electrical industry at that time, that is Western Union and the telegraph industry, wanted it on the ground floor, and they provided Edison about $130,000, about $3 million in today's money, uh, between the fall of 1878 and the spring, uh, the end of winter of, of 1881, so about two and a half years. What did Edison do with that money? So the original building is in the middle there, the original lab. He built a large new machine shop because he needed that for all the work on the system, including the generators. Uh, there was a glass blower shop that became important for the vacuum technology that was developed there, and an office and library. He funded the uh, purchase of books for the library with about $30,000 that he got for his uh, telephone uh, patents in Britain. 
He also hired new staff, uh, increasingly a scientific staff, two PhD chemists, uh, an assay chemist, uh, a scientific instrument uh, glass blower uh, from uh, Germany, and uh, the first person ever to have a master's in science at Princeton who had also studied uh, with Hermann von Helmholtz, one of the leading uh, scientists of the day in Berlin for a while. Uh, so besides the machinists, the self-taught people at the laboratory, there was this increasingly scientific staff. Together, uh, they developed with Edison uh, the incandescent lamp and the generator for his system during the first year of research. And then Edison turned to development work, uh, improving the lamp, developing the screw socket, the fixtures, the meters to measure the electricity, the safety fuse to make the system uh, uh, safe so there would not be fires, the underground conductors, and the distribution system as well as improvements in the generators. All this took place simultaneously as Edison prepared to move into New York to set up the first central station in lower Manhattan. To do that, he further expanded the lab staff um, so that there were probably at the height around 60 or so men working in this laboratory, about half of them machinists and about half of them experimenters. The other thing Edison did was to innovate lamp manufacture. Nobody had ever mass produced vacuum lamps before. And so Edison actually set up a factory in Menlo Park in a building that had been used for a little while uh, manufacturing electric pens. And the laboratory developed the special equipment that was used in there, including, of course, uh, the machine shop uh, was involved in that. Later on, this factory moved to Harrison, New Jersey. Um, and uh, Francis Upton, uh, who later took over the uh, running of the lamp factory uh, in 1884, described how because of the 2,744 2, experiments and special lamps they had created, that they, he was pretty sure that any factory starting would have a hard time competing with the Edison Lamp Company. And this was crucial to Edison's success as an inventor was that ongoing development work took place in combination with the manufacturing operations. So Menlo Park created, in a sense, a new model for invention, the first R&D laboratory, if you will, um, a model that began to be taken up by other inventors. Edward Weston, another electrical inventor, very involved in the development of electroplating technology, he also worked on arc lights uh, for street lighting. Uh, he became most famous for his meter technology, and the Weston Meter Company was uh, very important for a long time. Um, this is what the inside of his laboratory looked like, very much like the sort of thing that Edison had developed at Menlo Park, but in fact on a larger scale, uh, the uh, journal Engineering talked about how it was the largest private laboratory around, which, of course, Edison wasn't going to stand for. Uh, so the year after that lab opened up, Edison decided to build his own. I will have the best equipped and largest laboratory extant. The facilities incomparably superior to any other for rapid and cheap development of an invention and working it up into commercial shape with models, patterns, special machinery. In fact, there is no similar institution in existence. And the scale of Menlo Park, in fact, dwarfed anything that existed. So the main lab building is on the right. Uh, next to that are four smaller lab buildings, each of which is the same size as a single story of the original Menlo Park Laboratory building, 25 by 100. Um, at its height, there were about 150 men working at the laboratory in Menlo Park. It had a research library of about 10,000 volumes that was used on a daily basis. Uh, it had uh, these laboratories, chemical, electrical, metallurgical, as well as uh, facilities in the main building for other kinds of experimental work. The experimenters were mostly college men. Uh, graduates of technical schools who came to extend their knowledge of electrical matters. Um, many of them um, also went on to try to become inventors themselves, probably the most well-known, Reginald Fessenden, who was involved in radio technology later on. And there were two machine shops. Edison could literally have anything built at Menlo Park from, as he said, a lady's watch to a locomotive. He had an electric railway, experimental railway at Menlo Park. He had to have the castings and other parts made elsewhere and shipped to the laboratory. He did experimental work on electric railways at West Orange, and everything was made 
at the laboratory. So this is one of the big shifts that happens. Team research, something that he developed at Menlo Park, became common at West Orange. Uh, Edison later described how he did it. Organize a gang of one good experimenter, two or three assistants, assistants appropriate a definite sum yearly to keep it going, have every patent sent to them and let them experiment continuously. But at Menlo, excuse me, at West Orange, as at Menlo Park, you were working on Edison's ideas. So his were always the place that you started. By 1903, West Orange, the laboratory facility, was surrounded by Edison's factories to manufacture the various products from phonographs and sound recordings to motion picture equipment to uh, things like electrical apparatus like fans uh, and batteries as well. This is what that looked like by around 1920. Um, it was a huge facility. The, libra the laboratory was dwarfed by all of the factory buildings, but this R&D facility created both the inventions that were marketed and the development of product improvements uh, as well. A new model began to emerge around this time, um, and New Jersey again played a, a leading role. Uh, Charles Lee Reese, a chemist, PhD chemist, was hired by the DuPont Company, and he set up a laboratory in Gibbstown, New Jersey, known as the Eastern Lab. Uh, this is probably the first uh, true uh, R&D laboratory for uh, chemical companies. DuPont was a gunpowder uh, manufacturer. They were trying to expand into dynamite and ultimately expanded into all sorts of other chemicals, especially after World War I. Uh, but that research operation began in New Jersey in 1902, although the company was actually located across the river in uh, Delaware. And that kind of facility, not necessarily it connected directly to the manufacturing facilities, as was the case with Edison, but in fact separated uh, with a scientific staff to focus on research, uh, became a model for some other companies, places like RCA and Bell Labs, which will be the subject of a couple of other talks. So I hope I've given you a sense of how Edison uh, and New Jersey were involved in this shift from shop invention in the 19th century to uh, research laboratories like Bell Labs and RCA uh, in the 20th. Thanks. I'll be happy to take questions. Yeah. So Edison actually learned that practice from the telegraph industry. So the president of Golden Stock was one of the first corporate uh, officers to recognize that control of technology was crucial to a high-tech industry. And so part of his goal was to acquire the patents and the inventors like Edison that could keep the Golden Stock Telegraph Company at the forefront of uh, printing telegraph technology and help prevent competitors from uh, entering the field uh, very readily. William Wharton picked up on that idea from uh, Marshall Lefferts, the president of Golden Stock, um, and so one of the things that uh, he did was to hire Edison to work on what was known as duplex uh, telegraphy, which uh, Western Union acquired from a Boston inventor in 1872 to send two messages simultaneously. He hired Edison literally in part at Edison's suggestion, because Edison came to him with a bunch of designs for alternatives, to prevent other companies from being able to use duplex telegraphy. And out of that, Edison developed the quadruplex to send four messages, which was a, a significant improvement. But that's where he began to learn these strategies. And Lefferts also took him to his patent attorney, where Edison learned sort of the techniques of both protecting the patent by making sure he had a good record. Edison himself later had a very successful career in part because he became very good at managing his patents. And so, yeah, he's very much uh, sort of ahead of the time in that regard. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Paul Israel. Thank you.